Kilo. So uh, if you just join in this podcast, this is a Gladden podcast here. We discuss uh, issues that are relevant to human experience and history and professional issues that are inspiring and can help our people understand and the global community and how it functions in lives of profession and research. And today we're going to be talking more about research with, uh, with Sanjay. Uh, he is going to talk more about that. And I'm going to ask him some very prompting questions. And if you do have a question, you can just put it in the chat room and your question is going to get to him. So um, let's get to know our guest. Sanjay, can you tell our audience who you are? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Gaurmandu. Um, uh, hi, I'm Sanjay, um, Sanjay Sharma. I am a Nepali national, um, and I am also a PhD scholar at the National University of Singapore um, at the Department of Sociology. Um, um, what I am doing um, right now is, uh, so, so before that, basically I'm uh, right now stuck in my home in Nepal because of COVID, um, where I was supposed to uh, be in the field site and be talking to people, doing my research, um, getting data and uh, proceeding towards uh, writing my thesis very soon. But None of that is happening right now because of the COVID. Um, uh, yeah, basically that's very briefly about me. Nice, thank you so much for joining us. I can imagine what's happening with COVID all around the world, uh, even yet including the USA and specifically New York, you know exactly you heard about it. But it's good that we you know, keep Playing, playing safe and following the health guidelines and making sure that we are safe and the world is a better place. So let's talk about, uh, let's talk about migration. Um, let's first of all talk about what it means in your own context. Right. So um, specifically in the context of Nepal and also uh, largely in the context of South Asia, um, there are multiple facets of migration. There are various forms of migration. Right? Um, uh, and if we, if we come uh, specifically in the case of Nepal, uh, migration is mostly um, related to labor migration. A lot of Nepali, Nepali nationals, they go to um, Gulf countries and Malaysia mostly uh, to work as labor migrants. And most of them work in um, unskilled or semi-skilled jobs. So um, there is a lot of um, low scale, less skilled uh, labor migration happening from Nepal. But also um, Nepal, Nepal is historically very important um, fr from the migration perspective. Uh, when, the, when the British came in, um, in South Asia, when they were, uh, when the British East India Company was um, ruling in, uh, in, in, in various parts of South Asia, um, Nepalese were a good ally of the British um, after the Anglo-British, uh, Anglo-Nepal War um, that happened in 1814 to 1816, right? So after 1816, um, Nepalese were helping the British um, conquer, colonize, etc. Um, that's when a lot of migration happened from Nepal. A lot of Nepali men went with the British to fight for them. And that's, that's what uh, my research is also about. Um, that's where the Brit British constructed the Gurkhas. Uh, unlike a lot of other martial races, the Gurkhas are not a race per se, but a British construction of the, 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 of the Nepali nationals. Um, so yeah. Um, uh, when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, the British construct, are you talking about the, the Cotton, as we understand, are a particular group of people, right? Are, are uh -huh. they, do, do they belong to an ethnic group or do they belong to a particular community? And what were some of the uh, characteristic or attributes of them that the British saw and said, well, 
this can be the kind of the group of people that we can work with where there's something about them that was so uh, intuitive that this so that they could work with right so um, what happened in the 19th century early 19th century um, was Brit the british were writing a lot about these martial races that they knew about some of them were there in scotland for uh, for instance the highlanders in scotland they were supposed to be one kind of martial races having specialized war skills um, and when they came to south asia they were constructing they were they were recording um, similar kind of races um, that they knew um, in europe so um, a number of races were the, the british um, made note of a number of races in south asia as well uh, for for instance uh, the sikhs are one of the uh, races that the the british thought were martial they had martial abilities and similar with the were the gurkhas so the, the construction of gurkhas is very interesting um, because they were not they do not belong to any particular ethnic group they are not um, they are basically diverse set of individuals who live across nepal uh, and beyond right so what what happened is uh, when the british were in, when the british came in south asia uh, the current the modern day nepal was divided into many principalities many small states and one of those states states was called gorkha um, gorkha uh, right um, so gorkha is basically a place and then the king of the gorkha realized that the british are coming um, from the, from from um, india towards other parts of uh, south asia basically wanted to do trade with tibet and china uh, so this this king of gorkha he realized that he has to uh, conquer all these small states so he started started his um, conquer, conquering campaign his unification campaign so um, in in late 18th century he created this state uh, and attacked another um, another small principality that was called the uh, the nepal valley uh, where i am living right now so when the, when the king um, unified a lot of small principalities then this place was called nepal now um, but then there was still um, confusions with uh, the british so as to uh, name this this place that was recently constructed um, and one of the names that that they came up with is uh, what the the king was uh, also calling it gorkha right so uh, whoever came from gorkha was uh, also racialized as gorkha so if i belong to nepal for instance i am a nepali right now and then uh, 200 years back if people came from gorkha they were called the gurkhas but then um, it was not a citizenship it became a race so all the while till even till now people think gurkha is a race but it is not a race per se so how are you uh, connected to this research i understand the setting the context of this research is nepal obviously uh yeah. and you are nepalian uh, as well but how do you connect with this research how significant it is for you personally that that's a very interesting question because um whenever i go and talk to um the gurkhas they look at me and then they get confused because um they know that i am not a gurkha um and then um they think i am um, someone from south asia um especially this happens especially when i uh, go and talk to people in the uk so uh, i'll i'll come to it uh, come come to this point uh, in a while um a lot of gurkhas are in the uk uh, right now so a major part of my research is in the uk right uh, so if i meet people in nepal they won't be surprised they would just talk to me like a nepali right but if i go and talk to people in the uk if i approach the gurkhas in the uk they first think that i am um, some bangladeshi or some indian or some pakistani trying to talk to them um 
um, because of a diverse set of people who live in Nepal, right? Um, but uh, to, to answer your question again, um, when I was um, growing up as a child, I went to a school where um, the principal of the school was himself a retired British Persia um, soldier. Uh, he, he, he came back to uh, Nepal from um, wherever he was fighting and then he thought he should start a, a school. And then um, a lot of my friends uh, with whom I studied, they were also um, the children of uh, British uh, Gurkhas. Uh, their parents were mostly abroad, um, still serving. Uh, the father was still serving in the army. The mother was sometimes with the father abroad. And then these um, friends I had, uh, the children of the British Gurkhas, they were uh, living in the school hostel. Um, so that's where the, 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 um, the initial exposure to the Gurkhas came in. But then also how, um, what has happened uh, in the past 200 years when the, when, the, when the Nepalese came in contact with the British is the Nepali state has used this narrative of um, the Gurkhas being brave and martial to construct a national sense of identity uh, of the Nepali state itself. So um, if a Nepali, um, one, of, one of the ways uh, a Nepali introduces himself or herself to a foreigner is how um, brave um, descendant of a Gorkha uh, soldier he is or she is, right? Um, yes, so I, I was I was definitely going to get to that part because that's that's one of the description that the global description and of right. what would people know the, the Google has to be. And and that's one of the right. very intriguing part of this interview. And I wanted us to talk about that. But I just wanted to bring in a, uh, one of uh, a question from one of our our our, our audience out there who's really concerned about you know, you mentioned about the Gurkhas not belonging to a particular ethnic group, and this person wants to know, um, you know, if you are aware that the uh, Gurkhas are also of the Mongolian race and, uh, and not the, uh, the Brahmins, and what is your opinion concerning that? It seemed like uh, it seemed like we having we having some technical issues from Sanjay's end. Uh, hopefully, he will get back very soon, and we can continue. Uh, uh, so we, I hope you just keep keep log on, and we will get back to him very soon. Um, okay, yeah, he is. Uh, Yeah, so, yes, um, we're so sorry for the technical issues. Um, apparently, we're having some issue with connections, uh, with the connections uh, over there in Nepal. Uh, hopefully, he can get back online. I'm saying that he's trying to, and he will be back very soon. Um, and we can continue on this very fascinating discussion. Actually, there's some more, there are more to uncover in this discussion, especially uh, when it comes to the gender issue and how the gender, gender play a, a key role in the construction of the, the Gorgans. Uh, now we have him back. Um, so do you want to speak? Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> do you want to speak to the, uh, the question from the, one of our audience? Right. So um, I, I, I didn't hear the question properly. Can, can you repeat it? Please? So uh, he's concerned, I don't know what is he or she, but this person is concerned with your opinion on um, the Gokas uh, being of the Mongolian race and, right. and not the Burmans, especially when you mentioned that they, are, they don't belong to a particular ethnic group. What's your opinion on that? Right. So it, it, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, and also the, the construction of the Mongolian race and and how um, the Mongolian race is connected with the Gurkhas is, is itself uh, very interesting to, to ponder upon. 
what happened is when the British um, started recruiting the Gurkhas uh, after the 1816, what they thought is there are primarily four ethnic groups that had better martial skills than the others. So um, uh, those four ethnic groups are Gurungs, Moggers, Rais, and Limbus, right? So um, what, the, what the British did is they exclusively selected these four um, ethnic groups and they, they, were, they purposefully did not select the others initially. But then um, what also happened is people quickly realized that uh, the British are, are very selective based on people's surnames. Right. So if my surname was a Gurung, then my chances of getting recruited in the Gurkha was higher. So what people started doing is the non-Gurungs or the non-Moggers, non-Rais and non-Limbus, they changed their surnames just to dodge the British. So uh, a lot of non-Mongoloid people have also been recruited in the Gurkhas as well. Right. Um, uh, also to connect it with uh, the larger caste system that the Hindus have and uh, a lot of Nepalese belonging to the Hindu, um, um, uh, a lot of Nepalese following the, the Hindu religion. What happens is there is one caste group in the Hindu system that is that is believed to be more martial, right? The Chetris. Um, so although the British did not purposefully select the Chetris um, initially, um, a lot of Chetris are also, who are non-Mongoloids, are also recruited in the, in the Gurkhas, in the British Army. So uh, just a follow up to, the, to this concern, um, and I just want you to show more clarity on that. Right. Uh, this construction, did it lead to uh, a construction of an ethnic group, or did it lead to the construction of a race? What, what was the end? result of this British construction of the Gurkhas? What did it lead to? No, 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 no. Uh, it, it, it definitely did uh, lead to a race. So what I, what I am arguing is uh, what the British did is they constructed the Gurkhas not just, not just as a race, but also exclusively helped the Nepali nation build a, a sense of nationalism. So I'm not saying that they didn't construct a race. I, I, I am saying they, are, they have constructed a race. But what, what I am critiquing is um, this race is itself constructed. It was not, it was not a true race. Uh, although the, the concept of race in itself in sociology is, is deconstructed and, it's, and, and we argue that race is, is not, uh, not actually biological per se, right? Um, but but keeping that aside, what I am arguing is the the British, um, like what Edward Said uh, has talked in his um, write up on uh, Orientalism, um, the British have through a lot of rigorous scholarship been able to construct the Gurkhas as 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 a race. So that's why uh, a lot of people, when they think about the Gurkhas, they think that they are a particular racial group uh, that comes from Nepal. So, where are the Gurkhas today? Now we consider now uh, they are not uh, a construction. They are not a result, a race resulted through the construct, the British construction. Uh, today, I believe, and history have proven that that the British has maybe if they still have. Uh, control over these regions, they might be as limited as possible. Uh, so these construction might not be significant to this to, to the this, this dispensation today. So where are the Gurkhas today, and what role are they still playing? Uh, you know, in the region from Mongolian forward to Nepal. Right. So um, probably let me go back to uh, what I was talking a bit earlier about. Um, uh, the migration of the Gurkhas. Right? So when uh, the Gurkhas were, were formally um, or informally uh, started getting recruited into the British army after 1815, 1816, um, a lot of Gurkhas uh, and Nepalese for that matter started moving to various parts of South Asia, primarily concentrated in India. Um, 
So all these Nepali speaking regions in India, um, in Darjeeling, Sikkim, or Dehradun, um, there's there, there, you can you can see a lot of migration happening in the 19th and 20th century from Nepal to these parts of uh, India, and they're not just limited to India. They have they have the the Nepalese have migrated to uh, Bhutan, uh, Myanmar, Burma, um, and other parts of Siam, the modern day Thailand as well. Um, and then um, when when um, the British were involved in the First World War and the Second World War, the, the Gurkhas traveled with the British uh, to Europe or uh, during the Second World War to Southeast Asia and help the British win the, the wars, right? Um, and then um, um, fast forward to late uh, 20th century, early 21st century, what happened is the Gurkhas realized that the, the ex-British uh, um, Gurkhas, they realized that they have been discriminated a lot um, by the British in, in, in paying them a lot less salary for the wars they fought for. So what the Gurkhas did is they started petition and uh, they, they started um, filing court cases against the British government. And then uh, from late um, 20th century and early 21st centuries, a lot of um, Nepali nationals who were, uh, who had served in the British Gurkha, they started moving to the UK. Uh, a lot of British Gurkhas, the, the retired men and their families, their wives and their children are living in the UK right now. So that's what I mentioned earlier about my research. I would not be doing my research in, only in Nepal. I would be doing my research in the UK as well. Oh, okay. Okay, that's, that's I see where that comes from. Uh, so let's, I just want to go back a little bit, back to the construction of the Gurkhas. Um, what was the role of gender? Let's, let's look at the gender. Uh, how was it constructed in terms of inclusiveness and the role that gender play, uh, specifically uh, the role of women in, in that construction? Right, so um, gender is, is very important, but very ignored category when it comes to the Gurkhas. Um, so one of the things that happened is when the, when the, when the, the Gorkha state was fighting the war against the British in, in 1814, 15, and 16, a lot of men and women were involved in the war. So Nepali women were also fi fighting against the British. But what happened is the British only uh, recruited the men um, after the war um, because they thought the men were brave. The women were ignored since then, right? Um, and then when, um, so this is not just about men and women, this is also about different groups of men. So when uh, the, the Nepali men started getting rec recruited into the, the British army, uh, these men had to undergo, undergo the construction of um, bravery. They, the idea of uh, being brave was imposed upon them uh, to a certain extent, right? They might have been brave initially, but they had to prove their bravery so, to the British. So they had to internalize the military um, skills or the, ma the military masculinity that the British had constructed. So what I'm arguing is, um, the military ma masculinity was constructed by the British and then adopted by the Gurkhas. So there are diverse forms of masculinity there as well. Um, right. Um, so if you if you have uh, been following the literature, there are um, slogans like uh, "better to die than be a coward." That is the Gurkha motto even to this day. Right. There there are also um, other various forms of um, slogans that circulates around. For instance, uh, bravest of the brave uh, is one of the um, slogans that is uh, attached to the uh, Gurkhas. Right? Another one is uh, if someone says uh, the person is not afraid, then either, either the person is lying or the person is a Gurkha. Right? 
So all these narratives are trying to trying to build a kind of masculine aspect of the Gurkhas, right? Um, so no matter how your personality is, your 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 gender or your sexuality is, what the, the what the army, what the military does is frames you to a, in in a certain category, and you have to perform uh, into that. Right? So that's what. Um, the first being the, the Gurkhas had to pre prove their masculinity with the Gur with the British and they continually did that. The second is um, the idea of uh, men and women. Um, so as I said earlier, the women, although they were involved in the in the uh, Anglo-Nepal war, they were ignored by the British later on. Uh, and they they have always remained hidden in, in the in the notion of bravery and um, um, the idea of martiality that the Gurkha men have carried. So no one actually bothered about what was happening with the Gurkha women. Or when I, when I say Gurkha women, I'm talking about the, mostly talking about the, the wives or the daughters or the sisters of the Gurkha soldiers. Right? They were never asked about what was going on in their lives so when the when the men were fighting their wars there were women who were uncertain about what was happening in in the battlefield right um, so when people went for when the Gurkha soldiers went for world war one world war two there were no communication happening between them and their wives so the wives would probably get the husband who is back alive the husband could come back as injured amputee after uh, some accident in the war, or the husband might not come back at all. The husband would die in the war. Um, so all these narratives of the women have never been ex explored or recorded by anyone. Right? Um, and then um, the third aspect that comes with gender and migration in the context of Nepal is always the migration has been talked about from a very masculine perspective um, as a migration researcher when i was writing papers earlier what i used to do is i used to say that nepali men were involved in the british army that's when they migrated elsewhere blah 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 but i never talked about how women nepali women were migrating uh, for instance um, a lot of men nepali women have migrated with the uh, British Gurkhas um, to Southeast Asia, to, in, to Malaysia and Singapore um, during and after the Second World War, for instance. Right? But that history is never recorded. No one has actually explored that part at all. Um, so what, I, what I'm trying to do in my research is not just trying to um, explore the migratory side of the, uh, of the women, the Gurkha women, um, but also the non-migratory aspect of it. By, by, by non-migratory aspect, what I mean is when the husband was not around, how were the women coping up uh, in, in society? How were they coping up with their in-laws? What were their own personal stories of, um, of sorrows and happinesses? Right. So, so these are the aspects that I'm trying to record in my research. Well, that's, that's, that would be definitely fascinating to bring those to light, especially that they were actually in North by, uh, you know, early researcher. Uh, so one of the very last point I want us to talk about is this, because I'm fascinated with, you know, the issue of gender is, um, what, what does it look like contemporarily uh, with the women's involvement in the Caucasus community? Because the community stay as is, uh, the Caucasus community still exists today. So, uh, what has how has the culture involved, you know, as it relates to gender? I understand back then it was it was about war and, and and you know fighting, and so that masculinity was predominant. But right now, how has it involved to to you know to the our contemporary world in involving uh, gender inclusiveness? Hey, uh, that's a that's a very uh, good question, Guy Mondu. Uh, but I fear I would not be able to answer it um, to a very um, 
fuller extent because I'm still doing my research. I do not have a lot of um, information to answer it very properly. But uh, some of the things that I have come across till now is uh, even in the army, for instance, um, um, the British Gorkhas are trying to hire, they're trying to recruit women into the military, right? So military as an institution itself was very masculine and patriarchal. Uh, it is still very masculine and patriarchal, right? But um, it is trying to be inclusive by, by including um, uh, women or people who do not fall into the, uh, the, the gender binary division, right? So a lot of um, inclusivity is trying to be um, adopted there. But also how um, Nepali men and women have themselves evolved during these years, right? Earlier, um, until 1950s, um, a lot of Nepalese were not allowed to go to school. There was no public school uh, as such in Nepal until 1950, right? Um, and people were very less educated um, until to, to, to this day, right? Um, but what has happened now is uh, people are getting more educated and thereby when um, when the British Gurkha men take their wives uh, with them to the UK, for instance, there are greater chances of the wife taking her own job in the UK, right? So when I was living in the UK three years back, um, the family I used to live with the uh, the daughter-in-law was uh, a chartered accountant right um, there are a lot of women nurses um, uh, working in the uk right now who are the wives of um, the british workers or the uh, the daughters of british workers right and not just limited to um, these few um, employment sectors the the workers who um, Travel to the UK in in uh, in the early 21st century in the 2000s. Their children have gone into a number of various sectors where they are um, doing professionally very good. Right. So this what I'm trying to say is this has helped in a better gender relationship uh, between men and women. Right. Uh, the bargaining power of the women who otherwise would be um, illiterate and uneducated has now increased significantly. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's really promising and uh, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it's an encouraging news within our community. So uh, the final question to you now is, um, what do you hope to achieve at the end of this research? What, are, what, are, what is your goal? Uh, what, what is the message you want to to send out not only to the Gokas community or to the Nepali uh, community, but to the world at large, people who've studied and read about migration. And, right. and what is the message you want to, them to have about your research and what's, what's, how can it help us redefine what migration is? Right, um, yeah, that's a big question, but I, 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 I don't know if I would be able to redefine <laughs> migration per se. But what I'm trying to do is, uh, or probably how I think my research would help um, better understand gender and migration is, um, I am trying to give uh, a, a different perspective towards the way the Gurkhas were migrating from Nepal um, to the UK. Uh, and even before now, how men have migrated from, um, Nepal to various battlefields around the world. I'm trying to narrate that story from the perspective of women, how they saw their men go away uh, in the warfare, how they resisted those migrations, how they didn't like their men um, going abroad with the chances of them dying in the battlefield, right? So the perspective of women, I, I, I hope would uh, help to a certain extent, redefine the ideas of masculinity and bravery and gender relations as well. And then uh, also it comes down to uh, the idea of migration, the, the glorification of uh, Gurkha migration as well. So, um, and not just about 
So not just from the perspective of women, but also from the perspective of the Gurkha soldiers themselves. Uh, what has happened until now is um, the literature regarding the Gurkhas is mostly written by white men. What they do is they glorify and exoticize the Gurkhas. Um, they, they always portray the, the, the image of the Gurkha as a brave soldier. What I am trying to do um, is give the other side of the story as well. Uh, so um, when I talk to the, the, the retired Gurkha soldiers, they talk about the war in a, in a non-glorious sense as well. What they say is when a fellow friend is being killed or when they're wounded in the war, they, they feel sad. They, they, they have all these feelings of sorrow and unhappiness and sadness, probably leading also to um, a post-traumatic stress disorder or, or, or something like that, right? So these um, dark side of the war has not been explored at, as much, right? So what my research would also do is offer a critique to the um, the exoticization of the Gurkhas as well. Right. So uh, what I'm also trying to do is not just stop my research after I do my field work and then submit my PhD. What I'm trying to do is um, do is, is a number of things. For instance, uh, one, I am collecting as many photographs as I can that helps build an alternative history um, to, to the Gurkha migration uh, itself. So I've, started, I've recently started an uh, Instagram account where I'm um, posting all these archival photos that I can collect from whatever sources and then um, offer the Gurkha women's narratives about the war. For instance, one of the photos that I posted recently was about a, 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 a young child uh, receiving the Victoria Cross uh, on behalf or of her husband in uh, 1945 after the Second World War, right? So many people did not know that the girl child uh, was a widow of um, a, a Victoria Cross uh, recipient, right? And then um, that database that I would create in, in, in a span of one year or two year could be transferred to other people who are interested to work with the Gurkhas or to the Gurkhas themselves, the, the children of the Gurkhas. Right? Um, the other thing that I'm doing is uh, create an, um, an archive of uh, folklores and oral histories uh, uh, based on the interviews that, that I do or the already existing um, songs that are out there. Uh, so the database, what, what the database would do is, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Nepalese read, um, the literacy rate in Nepal was very low, so people didn't write as much, but they recorded their experiences through songs, for instance, right? So these songs would help me and other scholars or other interested individuals understand what was going on um, during, for instance, the, the Second World War, what were the, how the women uh, during the Second World War were uh, putting their sorrows when the men were uh, migrating away to fight for the British, for instance. Right? So, so I, I hope this archive that I would create at the end of my research and then continue creating after that would be very helpful for the interested individuals who, who want to explore more about the Gurkhas or gender and migration and historiography as well. Wow, I can't wait to, to explore that and see some of the how fascinating that will be. Uh, so yeah, thank you once more Sanjay for joining us. Uh, this has been very educative and uh, broadened our perspective as it relates to the transformation that you know gender has, has evolved and continue to evolve and uh, uh, the issue that about inclusiveness is I like that idea that you have this strongly into your research and you know, telling the story about people who actually experience what they experience and, uh, and not just telling the story about people who 
you know, has something to gain from, you know, whatever that was happening. So obviously they tell the story from their perspective. And that's the thing about storytelling, you know, everyone has, right. everyone tells the story from their own, you know, stand, stand, standpoint, because yes. they want the story to always narrate where they come from. But it's a very good initiative. And um, is there anything last you want to say to uh, those that are listening, uh, maybe in contributing to some of the work you're doing right now? Right. Yeah. Thank you, um, Daimon. You for, first of all um, for giving me this opportunity to talk to to to, to talk about um, whatever I have been able to do in the past few months. Um, right. Um, there's a lot to do, uh, and a lot of things are scattered right now. So I'm trying to bring all these scattered pieces together, and I, it'll take a, a while for me to do that. So one of the things that I want to tell the um, audiences. Um, is uh, if you have some uh, information about the Gurkhas, uh, some narratives that is hidden out there, um, please feel free to bring those out to me. Um, and then, um, so uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, narratives of the Gurkha women has not been explored yet, but um, these women are still out there. Um, living in our community, but still unheard. So if your mother or your sister is a Gorka, um, talk to her, listen to her story, and then let the world know about her story as well. Thank you, Garmin. Thank you, so thank you as well, Sanjay. Um, definitely, if you have a relative or a friend who will have this rich history, you know, sometimes I know it's difficult to tell some of this history because uh, like he said, those were war moments, people that had some terrible experience, they don't want to talk mm -hmm. about it, uh, you know, but it's, it's worth sharing because the more you talk about it, the more you share it, it becomes mm -hmm. part of an archive that can benefit the world to come, you know, we can learn from some of uh, what happened and, and be able to, rec you know, as we reconstruct our society in different perspectives, we can be able to add that piece to it and make it a better place to live. So thank you once more, Sanjay, for joining. And for those of you who uh, watch, we say thank you for watching. And uh, you can definitely come back to this page and watch it over. And if you also, t um, as your YouTube follower, you can check on YouTube, the Gladden uh, podcast. You can follow the page. This video is going to be posted there. You can watch that. And you can also listen to it on all of the different uh, podcast platforms you can imagine, whether it's Google Podcasts, iTunes Podcasts. It will always be available. You can listen to all of this uh, education that Sanjay had provided. <laughs> That's a lot of education. There's a lot of research he's put into that, I can imagine. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. lot of work. And uh, you can definitely contact him and if you have any information and if you maybe just want to talk to him and share some of your stories of parents who were Gokans before and, you know, and left some very valuable stories with you, you can also contact him and you can have a very uh, good conversation. So thank you once more and uh, have a great day. Stay safe and let's get this COVID out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ramadu. Okay. All right. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.